Let's get started. So uh, my name is Brad Woodberg. I'm a product manager with uh, Emerging Threats at Proofpoint. And uh, today we're going to be talking about command and control channels. So uh, just a quick uh, rundown of what we're going to be covering. A few minutes on the intro, but we're going to go heavy into some malware techniques. We're going to talk about you know, actual malware, uh, case studies, what's, what we're kind of seeing, predictions and trends uh, for the malware. Um, I think it's actually a... Uh, so we're having an issue on that. I think I think I have like one older uh, version of the rev on here, but we're just going to plow through it. Uh, we're going to talk about defense, and, uh, and then we'll again wrap this up all in 45 minutes, so that uh, we can go get some uh, beer and have some fun tonight. So why command and control, right? Why is this topic so interesting? Because uh, you know so much of the uh, uh, you know uh, so much of the information that, that you know that we talk about that we see in the security industry, blogs, articles, etc., focus on vulnerabilities, exploits. And the actual malware, and these are all great topics, um, you know, all very interesting. Uh, but uh, you know, one of the big challenges for anyone who's operating an IDS, you know, actually dealing with this on the front lines, is we know that trying to detect, uh, you know, vulnerabilities, the whole CVE game, um, you know, different types of exploits, uh, you know, it's it's very noisy. It's not very high fidelity. You oftentimes will, uh, you know, have, um, uh, you know, alerts that trigger when actually, uh, you know, an asset wasn't actually breached. Um, but actually, when you look at command and control, that's actually the point where you can say, hey, with high confidence, I know that this asset has been compromised. Um, you know, when you see that that control channel is reaching out, you know, it's kind of, uh, as uh, Rashid Wallace and my Detroit Pistons once say, you know, the ball don't lie. And uh, when you see that command and control channel, you know that something's going on. But probably the other thing that's really interesting about command and control is that this is actually the point where you go, you know, from being on pure defense, um, you know, you're getting hounded all day long, you know, attacked from every which way, uh, to actually the tables are being turned on the attacker. So, um, you know, where you had to get it right every single time and they only had to get it right once, now it's the other way around. In order for them to maintain that connection, uh, to maintain that control over that asset, they have to be right all the time. Uh, and so that's why I think, uh, you know, this is interesting and uh, why, you know, why we should talk about it today. So, uh, you know, just a minute or two, you know, just when we look at just how, how this whole thing gets started, right? I, the way I see it, there's really two primary ways that assets are being compromised. You have executable content, uh, you know, this is your traditional malware, uh, scripts, macro embedded uh, in Word documents and other Office file formats, etc. Um, you know, there's actually not an exploit happening here, it's just um, oftentimes now it's just social engineering, get someone to open a doc and, uh, and, and then, you know, there's a malware that now runs the machine. Uh, the other way is the exploit-driven approach, which is obviously ever so popular with uh, with the exploit kits, um, and this is where you know you're actually taking advantage of a vulnerability to be able to gain execution control on an endpoint. But really, it doesn't matter how it happened. The fact is, you know, all that matters is that it's been compromised. So, um, you know, to say a word or two, like why do why does malware even need command and control channels? Like, w w what's happening here? Um, you know. Oftentimes, when an asset is breached, it's not under the best of, of, of scenarios. Um, you know, it may happen on an asset that really isn't the ultimate target, ultimate goal. It doesn't have the information that uh, you know that uh, uh, an attacker is looking for. Um, there might not be sufficient privileges. Uh, it might, you know, especially when you're dealing with uh, exploits. You know, you have a very small buffer uh, or, or window in which to fit the actual payload in, so you have to deliver it in pieces. Um, and um, you know, really. Uh, you, you know, oftentimes a lot of malware just doesn't have a full, especially if you're dealing with like crimeware, you know, not so much target attacks, um, you know, it's basically shipped bare bones and it needs to get more information before it can uh, pull off whatever it's trying to do. So that's where command and control comes in. Um, you know, j just a word or two, I mean, you know, basically the command control channel is going to be used for a lot of different things, for pushing the actual configuration, for escalating the breach, as I mentioned, um, and this is where it's going to be reaching out to command control infrastructure. Um, another aspect of command and control is actually exfiltration. So getting the information, you know, the intellectual property that's on an endpoint, on an asset, out into uh, you know the attacker's hands. So if we look at something like uh, like Locky, uh, you know maybe going through and cataloging all the files on the endpoint, uh, figure out what's interesting and encrypting them. Um, you know if we look at something like uh, uh, Zbot, uh, it's actually this one is actually using a DNS channel uh, for you know a command control. So uh, you know they didn't even have to use anything special or customized. They're actually or even direct for that matter with DNS. You can just send a query and it's going to find its way home 
and essentially all the way to the uh, server and back. So, uh, you know, in this case, it's uh, actually exchanging commands and information for the uh, for the malware to uh, to take advantage of. So let's just take a quick look at uh, you know an ever popular uh, uh, vector. So the Anglo exploit kit, may it rest in peace. Um, you know, this is, I, I chose this because it's just so proli prolific, uh, you know, in the last few years, um, you know, even, you know, I saw like a bakery down the street from my house uh, had, uh, their website had actually been popped and, and was serving up an Angular redirector. And that's really the interesting thing, um, you know, uh, uh, is that, um, you know, it's, it's not that there's, not that the signs are always so obvious, uh, you know, leading up to an infection. You know, it's not like it was, uh, you know, defaced or something like that. It was just, you know, there was a little iframe shoved in there. And, you know, if you weren't running, uh, you know, some security software, you wouldn't, you would never know. Um, but anyhow, uh, we digress. Uh, so, so looking at the Angular exploit kit, you know, first, you know, typically you're going to hit some sort of a redirector, right? Uh, in this case, as I mentioned, our, our poor bakery. Uh, and that is going to redirect you to a traffic distribution system. Um, so this is basically going to evaluate your endpoint. It's going to say, hey, you know, they're running Microsoft Windows uh, 7 and Flash, this version. Okay, we're going to custom tailor an exploit to that actual, um, uh, an exploit to that endpoint. Um, and then finally, you know, an exploit in payload will, will be delivered, oftentimes by different infrastructure. Now, here's the really interesting thing about this. Up until this point, um, there's no, you really don't have confidence that an asset has actually been compromised. And all the while, you're probably chasing down a million alerts from your IDS and all sorts of other endpoint systems uh, because, you know, saying, hey, you know, we saw this Angular redirector and blah, 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 and there's this exploit and, you know, checked what version of Flash. But there's really no indication, you know, no, no high fidelity uh, uh, indication that this has actually been fully compromised until you see that command and control. Uh, and once you see that, then you know for sure that, um, you know, that, that the system has been uh, overtaken. Uh, now, just a quick word, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times people will get uh, lateral infections uh, uh, confused with uh, actual command and control. Uh, and so, Basically, with lateral infections, you know, we're, we're, typically what you're talking about is how malware is going to spread within an organization. Um, and, um, uh, you know, one thing that I think is a big differentiator is that typically lateral infections will leverage native enterprise protocols uh, to, to spread. Not exclusively, but, but that's a lot of what we see. Um, uh, whereas command and control may be anything from a traditional channel um, to, uh, you know, uh, so, so basically it may be like a HTTP, HTTPS, it may be a custom protocol. We'll talk about some of the different trends and things uh, in, in just a little bit. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but effectively, um, uh, you know, the, the internal lateral stuff, like if we take Locky for, for, you know, as a perfect example, and, and all the hospitals uh, that made a lot of news, um, you know, when they got breached and all their, you know, uh, files were encrypted and the whole place shut down uh, and they had to pay $17,000 ransom, which is really quite a steal in my, my opinion for uh, full operations of a hospital. But, uh, but yeah, glad it wasn't more. Um, in that case, you know, basically it was just an endpoint that got compromised. It wasn't like the file server got breached uh, and then, you know, it actually, uh, you know, broken, the, uh, you know, actually encrypted the files. It was an endpoint that had access to the file server using SMB. It encrypted the files. Uh, so you, you actually do see a lot of that, you know, just leveraging the native protocols that are within uh, the network itself, whereas command and control is a far, uh, far more, uh, ex you know, rich and exotic and, and interesting uh, um, uh, set of uh, protocols that are used. Now, I'd like to kind of just, you know, just before we get into the, the meat, you know, just talking about how kind of the, the cat and mouse game has evolved, because like many things, um, you know, the attackers kind of operate on a, uh, you know, on an economical scale, right? You know, they don't want to, especially when you're talking about crimeware, but they don't want to do, you know, take more effort than they need to, you know, spend more money, more time to, uh, to make their infrastructure more robust. Um, so they're going to kind of, you know, play along with the vendors and what is, you know, um, actually, you know, being effective to the point where it's not, then they kind of up the game. Um, and, you know, a lot of the very early malware was just, you know, leveraging very simple, you know, high level or high, uh, high, high range, uh, like TCP UDP ports um, that, you know, could really easily be filtered out on a, on a router or on a firewall, you know, easy as that. Um, 
you know, kind of uh, evolved into leveraging other applications like IRC uh, for, for command and control. Um, and then of course, you know, as some organizations started to tamp down more and more and restrict firewall access and outbound proxy access, uh, you know, a lot of them, and really the, the funny thing is that there was a, at the, the exact same time I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of the, the peer to peer applications, the file sharing apps, BitTorrent and so forth, they kind of converged along with the malware because they realized that, hey, you know, these ports are, are almost always open, so, you know, so we can leverage them. Malware also shifted over port 80, port 443. Then you had the NGFWs come out that could identify, hey, this isn't HTTP, this is some, you know, uh, binary protocol that we've never seen, so we can block it. And all that isn't very interesting, but what's starting to get more interesting is how uh, a lot of the malware is leveraging, um, you know, different types of cloud apps, uh, and it's actually, um, you know, doing uh, steganography and in, in encoding messages in, um, you know, in files and in various other uh, uh, metadata that we'll we'll see. We'll go through some examples in a bit, um, and this is kind of where you know where I think a lot of the future is, but um, you know. Essentially, the malware has gotten to a point where it, 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 you know, it's really getting sophisticated in command and control channels. Now, at the same time, it's important to look at how uh, command and control systems are being hosted. Um, you know, uh, n this isn't like categorically, you know, a, a, a precise, uh, you know, kind of drop off at any point in time uh, for for when things change over. But you know, but we actually do see you know progression, especially with some of the more sophisticated actors and malware. You know. At the very beginning, everything was kind of statically hosted. Um, you had uh, IPs that were hard coded into malware, and the malware wasn't really changing. So today, we still see IPs that are hard coded into malware, but um, you know, it, it it wasn't really you know the, you would have these uh, C2 hosts that are up for you know years, and uh, you know it would take a long time for that to kind of filter into uh, you know various lists and so on and so forth. Um, you know that the, you know I think that those days are uh, you know things have evolved uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, shifted to leveraging DNS, but again, you still had a single point of failure, a name, um, you know, and uh, even though the IP could change and you could route the traffic elsewhere, uh, you, were, you still had to, you know, cope with the fact that, you know, if that DNS name was discovered and blacklisted, it wasn't changed, and again, we're talking over a long period of time, you know, not like what we have today, which can be, you know, hours or days, uh, basically the, the DNS, uh, uh, you know, the, the malware could be shut down. Config updates, malware would actually, you know, go out and, and update itself. Again, not particularly sophisticated, but where things started to really get interesting in, in my mind is, you know, around the time of the game over botnet with, uh, with the Zeus malware because um, uh, it certainly wasn't the, the very first, but we saw, you know, organizations really, really, really had a, a very hard time for, for several years. I mean, you know, for, for, you know, almost, you know, Eight years or something, uh, trying to control this malware because it leveraged more advanced techniques, you know, domain generation algorithms, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, C2 infrastructure. So you really got rid of that, um, you know, that that centralized model uh, in the same way that you know, like BitTorrent and you know, uh, uh, Skype and other types of peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer based uh, networking uh, protocols and applications would work. Um, and perhaps the most interesting is that now so many of the, uh, or not so many, but we're seeing more and more of the uh, uh, malware starting to leverage cloud services as C2. So basically you don't even have to operate anything yourself. Um, you know, we'll get in the list a little bit, but you know, you can use Twitter, you can use Amazon, you can use the comment section, um, you know, kind of the classic, uh, you know, Cold War spy drop where, you know, you bring the briefcase in the park and you drop it and you leave and someone else comes and picks it up. It's kind of the same approach and the beauty of it is it requires almost no investment um, and uh, we'll, we'll get, you know, we'll save more for that uh, in, in, in just a bit. Um, so yeah, so one of the things that I found uh, most interesting is, is steganography and, uh, you know, what's kind of happening, uh, you know, some of the potential. We've seen, you know, hints of this uh, certainly in a bunch of different malware and I think it's, you know, probably one of the most, uh, you know, powerful, uh, you know, ways to be able to exchange information in a covert channel. Um, you know, basically this is hiding information in plain sight. It's been used, you know, it's not anything new been used for centuries. Uh, if you guys have ever uh, seen the video of, um, uh, I think it was an Army or Naval Captain, uh, Jeremiah Denton, uh, who was captured in Vietnam, and he actually blinked in Morse code. They were, you know, doing one of those kind of captive videos where they interview and ask all these questions, and he actually blinked in Morse code 
torture. And of course, they put out the video, everyone, and I'm sure that they probably knew that that type of thing was going on anyways, but it was, you know, very, very powerful because here, you know, no, you know obviously the, the Vietnamese uh, army didn't know, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it kind of made it through. So I think a lot of the kind of similar techniques uh, can be used in actual malware uh, for covert channels. And when you look at it, there's actually just a, a wealth of, of potential opportunities and places that you can hide this data. Um, you know, uh, everything from protocol headers, uh, if you're on, talking about the network layer, um, metadata and files, you have, um, you know, all different types of, um, uh, you know, encodings, um, audio, video, et cetera, we'll go into some of this, um, and it just really m uh, makes for a, uh, an excellent place to hide your data and to have plausible deniability. And of course, you can layer other, um, uh, you know, other techniques on top of it. So you can leverage encryption plus DAG to kind of hide things, um, you know, in plain sight, if you will. So let's take a, a look at a few examples. So um, this is actually an, an APT malware sample uh, that, that we saw. Um, and uh, I uh, obviously anonymized the, uh, the IP addresses. Uh, but, but basically what was happening here was that the, um, the, the intro machine that was compromised, we think it was kind of like a Chinese APT, um, uh, it was sending TCP packets, um, you know, and, and there was no flags, which is obviously a, a, an interesting uh, a problem, zero window. Um, and it was never establishing session, so it was actually communicating to a C2, you know, just by sending these packets, just by leveraging the, the, the fields in the headers. Um, and this can really be done with a number of different protocols. It's not anything that's restricted to, to, to TCP. Um, another example is, um, you know, when it comes to images, we're seeing, you know, malware like VawTrack and others, that they'll actually embed configuration in an image. Uh, so th in this case, what I did was I used a tool called OpenPuff and I took, um, uh, you know, the DEF CON logo, DEF CON 24 logo, in one logo, I ha you know, is just the original, and the other is there's an encoded message. Um, and as you can see, th there's, you know, you can't see, right? Uh, it's, it's, there, there's nothing uh, that, that our eyes can distinguish. What's actually happening here is it's actually uh, in, uh, using the least significant bit, and it's encoding the message or the file, you can do anything, in that least significant bit. So, you know, the color palette is tweaked by, you know, just one tiny uh, value in, in, in each pixel, and that's enough that, you know, another party could come across it, grab it, extract the message out if they know what to look for, but to not only the human eye, but even other computers, it would be very hard to be able to detect this type of technique. So let's talk about another uh, set, uh, you know, besides just trying to hide, what are attackers trying to do to ensure that uh, their command and control channels are, um, you know, are, are uh, uh, not compromised. Um, and so there's a number of different uh, uh, counteroffensive techniques that they're taking. Um, you know, one technique is, um, is, is to actually filter who can connect uh, back. And, and this is used in other uh, cases too. I mean, it may be used in the case of um, not just for C2, but it can be used in the case of, um, uh, you know, actual malware infections, right, especially targeted phishing, you know, they want to make sure that vendors uh, and also non-target, um, you know, assets, uh, uh, you know, when, when, when they're dealing with targeted uh, attacks, um, aren't going to be, uh, you know, potentially compromised because, of course, they don't want vendors learning the secrets and so on and so forth. Um, you know, with crimeware, there might be a little bit less, uh, you know, they, they, they might care less and, and cast a wider net over what they're trying to, uh, to compromise, so you might not see that quite as much, uh, but we do actually see a lot of filtering uh, from, you know, IP address spaces, um, you know, not only countries, but even down to individual organizations if they're targeting an actual organization. Um, another thing is uh, that, that can be leveraged is actual, uh, you know, kind of stagger, you know, hidden messages in, in handshakes. Uh, Poison Ivy is a really interesting, uh, you know, long-standing piece of malware that does that. It, it actually kind of encodes, a, a, you know, a, a handshake in the, in, the, um, in the initial connection. And so, you know, even on that, that essentially, you know, first uh, data packet, it'll know, you know, hey, this is a, a legit, um, you know, uh, system or not. Um, so we can, you know, just filter that out without, uh, you know, uh, if, if there's, you know, just some other type of asset trying to reach out, it can filter it. And of course, encryption. 
Um, you know, uh, especially leveraging, uh, you know, preloaded SSL certs. Um, it's interesting, we'll talk about Let's Encrypt because it has some implications here, but essentially, you know, you can, if you just preload a trusted SSL relationship, you know, uh, the kind of public key uh, or, 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 or symmetric key into the actual malware, it can make a connection out uh, immediately. Um, and uh, so they can basically ensure that only malware um, that, or, or at least until that, that certificate has been compromised, only malware that is the actual target malware can reach out and so other types of, uh, uh, you know, SSL snooping tools that are trying to grab information uh, wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to uh, have success there. And uh, just anecdotally, you know, just in terms of what, what some of the things that we're seeing is that there's actually been a pretty strong push to a lot of anti-sandboxing techniques uh, by the attackers. Um, I won't get into a lot of the specifics, but you can, you know, we're, we're seeing that it's getting harder and harder. You know, if any of you guys like, um, you know, there's there's open source tools like like Cuckoo and, and other rigs, you know, the attackers are definitely trying to get wise to, um, you know, to, to prevent sandboxing analysis of their, uh, you know, in, in a major way, right? This is not a new thing, but we're seeing just, it, it really the, the stakes uh, are ramping up on uh, malware that's trying to, you know, kind of fly it below the radar. So uh, it's not just from a C2 perspective. There's a lot of things all the way from the exploit to the, um, you know, to, to, to the command and control where this type of thing is happening. Uh, just a word, I mean, you know, there's obviously different types of, uh, uh, you know, kind of families, right? Uh, you know, crimeware, this is just gonna be casting a huge wide net. Um, typically these are pretty chatty, but they will, you know, we will see, um, you know, that they'll go to a little bit greater lengths uh, in a lot of cases to, to avoid uh, uh, detection. A lot of the target attacks, I mean, you'd be surprised, you know, a, a lot of them are still just leveraging off the shelf remote access tools, right, and, and other commercial tools. Um, you know, they, 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 they are targeted in that they are, you know, the, the, the actual actor is targeting a particular party, a particular organization, but they're not terribly sophisticated all the way up to the targeted espionage um, where, you know, just the sky's the limit, right? Um, it, you know, th th this, uh, you know, in some, some cases they may lack C2 altogether, but, you know, if you think about the, you know, the Stuxnets and the Flames and the Dukus and others, um, you know, there can be some pretty sophisticated uh, command and control that can happen and, and even insider threats uh, to, to basically make those, uh, make those work. So that we kind of covered, you know, we talked a little bit about some evolution, things that we've seen. Uh, historically over time. We talked about some of the different uh, components of, of, uh, of malware. Let's actually dive into a bunch of different case studies and, and look at how different pieces of malware are, um, you know, are uh, communicating with, uh, with command control. So Ghost Rat is like, you know, probably one of the most simple examples. And again, you know, this is, this is out there. There still is a, uh, you know, a, a lot of Ghost Rat that we see infections um, uh, because it's just such a, um, you know, um, prevalent tool that, that anyone can use. And, you know, this is just essentially, you know, they, uh, the, at least the commodity versions, obviously anyone can modify any of these things, um, but, you know, it's actually gonna have, you know, a string in the actual payload. So, um, so it's really easy for, say, like an IDS to be able to identify it because it's just, you know, it, it's there, it's, it's not really so obfuscated. Uh, it's kind of like if you look at like the evolution of BitTorrent, you know, uh, you know, it started on just, running on random ports and then, you know, they switch to port 80, but then they, you know, not exclusively, but, you know, they would say BitTorn in the, in the, in the actual uh, protocol and then they got to the point where they're using, you know, very advanced, um, uh, 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 forgetting the name, Ketamelia, um, uh, uh, distributed hash table functions to ensure that, you know, there, there wasn't such a, a, an easy way to match specific bits because everything was being uh, dynamically generated on the fly. So Poison Ivy, we kind of talked about a little bit earlier where basically, um, you know, this is leveraging, uh, you know, a handshake. So, uh, you know, it's, it's trying to basically identify is who's connecting to me, uh, you know, a target asset. Um, is it actually, you know, could it potentially be a researcher? They typically will embed, you know, there'll be some, the malware will be delivered, it'll have a password in it, uh, and that is used in the challenge authentication um, so that, you know, even if you have different strains of poison ivy, um, you know, an individual actor can, you know, differentiate and make sure that, that only the correct target is talking to them. Um, and again, that can be important because if you, you know, just allow anything wide open, it means that, you know, the viability of this malware, uh, of this actual compromise is going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, not as long-lived because it'll be too easy to identify, too easy to take down. 
NanoLocker, this one, uh, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, came out uh, uh, last year is really interesting uh, uh, JavaScript, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ransomware, you know, ransomware has just been absolutely blowing up. But one of the, 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 you know, the things that I found really interesting is, again, not necessarily leveraging, um, you know, like HTTP or a TCP based protocol, but actually uh, leveraging uh, the network itself and some of the, you know, the, your traditional tools within a network. In this case, it was actually, you know, uh, encoding the, uh, the, the uh, Bitcoin address in ICMP. Uh, so basically, you know, just, you know, send a, a, a packet, get a packet back and, uh, and you know, know exactly uh, what to do for the, uh, you know, for, for basically, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, holding the, uh, extorting the, uh, the victim. Um, and, um, you know, the, again, the network protocol layers, especially a lot of the legacy protocols, have a lot of great hiding spots. I mean, if you look at the difference between, like, IPv4 and IPv6, now, granted, IPv6 has all the next headers, and, you know, there could be some things, interesting things that you could do there, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, a space where, you know, at the time, you know, in the days of yore, they didn't know precisely, you know, that this whole internet thing was going to blow up, so they put lots of, uh, you know, lots of padding and other, other uh, potential areas where you could hide things in, um, and, uh, you know, as prevalent as these protocols still are today, it makes a really great uh, a channel for attackers. So Game Over Zeus, we, you know, uh, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, where, um, you know, basically they, they want to avoid having the, you know, kind of uh, fixed string centralized model and, um, you know, and to make it hard for IDSs to identify. Um, so actually what they do is, is a combination of techniques, but basically uh, they will XOR information in the packet payloads, um, so it's always changing and it, you, you know, it's very difficult to leverage signature-based technologies with traditional IDSs to be able to identify this malware because basically um, it is, you know, it, it is always changing. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't other ways to do it, um, but, uh, you know, your, your traditional uh, tools of the trade, if you will, um, you know, need not apply. Now, Drydex, uh, uh, you know, Bing Trojan, uh, obviously has, you know, just kind of, it, it, it took for, for quite a long time the, you know, just the, the whole enterprise sector by storm. Um, and who would have thought that, you know, in 2015 through 2016, that macro-based malware would be, you know, so pervasive and successful. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, it, it, it is and it was. Um, and, uh, you know, even to this day, you know, there still is, uh, you know, a great deal of, of malware that's leveraging these, you know, age-old techniques from, you know, the days of, you know, Windows 95 or whatever. Um, uh, particularly interesting is, you know, one shift that we've kind of seen is, you know, it's getting harder and harder to attack the machine. Right, um, uh, uh, because of you know different types of security protections that are built in, um, and so attackers are you know kind of saying, ah, forget about that. We're just going to attack the, the human. And so I think like Drydex is a great example of that, um, where you know uh, someone will you know get a document delivered. It'll you know w one really cool example that that, that I loved was uh, uh, it, the the document would actually be blurred, uh, and so it'd be an invoice doc, it'd be blurred, but there'd be a message that says you know. Uh, you know, click enable content uh, so that so that the message will be you know uh, uh, um, you know visible. You know, this may this this uh, this payload may be uh, you know corrupted. If you you know uh, uh, click enable content, it'll it'll be visible, and that's exactly what it did. Unbeknownst to the user, it also reached out, grabbed a payload, and you know popped the machine. Um, and and any virus traditional AV couldn't keep up with that because they would send a, you know a new hash of those documents. They would send millions and millions, you know, hundreds of millions even uh, on some days. Um, and so tremendously successful even to this day. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of different um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, flavors, if you will, of the different malwares because they may be done by different actors. Um, but, you know, in this case, in, in, in this one, you know, they're actually, again, leveraging the kind of the blind, the dead drop, uh, just like I kind of talked about with like Twitter, Amazon, you know, using Microsoft comments uh, to be able to essentially, you know, deliver uh, command and control information um, that can be, you know, exchanged between uh, this uh, endpoint and the actual server in a covert fashion. Now Tor, um, you know, obviously Tor is, is near and dear. It has, uh, you know, some very important real-world uh, uh, applications, uh, you know, especially in uh, certain countries and regimes and for journalists. So certainly not trying to, uh, to knock on Tor, uh, but, uh, you know, for the same reasons why it's great for the, um, you know, the aforementioned re uh, uh, use cases, uh, it's 
actually becoming quite a problem for, uh, for a lot of the research community because it doesn't even really require any type of, uh, you know, client. You know, you can literally uh, use like Tor to web and, and do this whole thing clientless. So uh, whether it's uh, Vault Track or uh, Delexis or, you know, there's a whole number. And we'll look at some trends that, that I've seen uh, in a minute. You know, Tor really is a, uh, you know, a, a great way to essentially bridge that gap between the endpoint and the command and control channel. Um, you know, just kind of, you don't have to worry about anything once you establish that tunnel. Oh yeah, so, so basically, uh, uh, quick animation here. Uh, so, you know, just showing here, we got the initial compromise uh, where, where uh, you know, the, the, the payload is, is delivered as exchange. Um, uh, you know, the, the endpoint is probing for uh, Tor information, Tor nodes, doing DNS resolution. Um, and then finally, it's making its connection to uh, Tor to web. Uh, and so it can exchange this information uh, covertly. Now, Air Viper, uh, this was one, uh, uh, you know, we did some research on at, at Proofpoint. Uh, this is obviously a targeted uh, APT attack, um, you know, uh, against, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the parties in the Middle East, we'll say, uh, Israeli. Uh, and, uh, and basically, um, you know, it was just leveraging simple HTTP. Um, so even though that this is, you know, kind of a, a sophisticated target attack, you can see that, you know, sometimes uh, it's easier to blend in and remain kind of obscured, if you will, than to go completely out of your way uh, to be able to essentially evade detection. So now we talked about a few different uh, you know, types of malware. Let's look at some trends. So one of the first ones that's really interesting is SSL. Again, just like Tor, SSL is a, you know, is, is a critical, fundamental uh, you know, component of, uh, uh, of our lives, and, and justly so. Um, you know, we basically went in the last couple of years from about 30% of the internet traffic um, to, you know, uh, just right around, uh, you know, 70% uh, today uh, leveraging SSL. Uh, and so what does that mean when it comes to, um, you know, to encryption, or sorry, to, uh, to command and control? Um, uh, in, in and of itself, it didn't mean that much. But one thing that, that was a huge game changer is Let's Encrypt, again. Uh, excellent uh, project and, you know, um, basically allowing anyone to get SSL certificates without having the security poverty line. Um, you know, the browsers would trust it, so on and so forth, so you could secure your applications. But now the attackers are leveraging that too, right? Uh, because they say, hey, you know, I can now, in an automated fashion, get legit SSL certs that the client is going to trust for free, and, um, you know, I can just burn them, you know, and uh, just like a domain name, uh, just kind of rifle through them. Um, so while I don't think that this will have, you know, much of an impact on, like, the state-sponsored, uh, uh, you know, malware, I think that, you know, especially for crimeware, it's like, why wouldn't you throw it in, in a, you know, in an encrypted tunnel and just make it that much harder uh, for organizations to, uh, to, to find this information? Now, IPv6 is really interesting because, you know, we don't see quite as much of it as, as one would expect, uh, and even in the case of malware today, um, you know, it's uh, you know it's it's not as prevalent uh, uh, as, as as you know we probably would have predicted you know five years ago. You know, even with the all the basically IPv4 net blocks being uh, exhausted, um, and uh, but, but but it actually represents a pretty big uh, challenge for us in the security community. You know, you can get your own you know slash 48 from. Uh, you know, from Hurricane Electric, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, 65,000 uh, net blocks with each, you know, I don't even know what that number is, you know, trillion, whatever, uh, of hosts for yourself, right? Um, and so some of the, you know, traditional things that we could do where we could say, hey, you know, we can, you know, blacklist individual IPs or even, you know, kind of pseudo net blocks, like, how do you do that when, you know, anyone can get access to such a massive number of IP addresses? Um, you know, I definitely think that, that you know, sooner or later, IPv6 is going to, you know, start to make a big splash. It's just once we hit that tipping point of, uh, you know, uh, of, of availability uh, to, to, to endpoints. And we're, we're definitely, I think we're, we're starting to get there very soon. Um, and the other interesting thing about IPv6 is a lot of security technology actually still doesn't support it, surprisingly enough. Or, or it does, but, you know, you're running an ancient version of whatever firmware, you know, from a vendor and, and, it, and it doesn't support it. 
or, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, with IPv6, um, you know, there's all the different tunneling capabilities. So, um, you know, even today you can do IPv6 over IPv4 tunneling in a number of different protocols. Uh, IP protocol 41 uh, is, is a good example of that, but you can do it over GRE and so on and so forth. Um, and because you can take that approach, you know, you, you know if, if uh, security technology can't strip off those layers, can't recognize it, um, then it's just, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a perfect path, right? Because it can just send it right on through where it may detect it in an unencapsulated format. It'll totally be blind to it, totally miss it uh, when it comes to just, you know, slapping a header on it. Tor, as I mentioned, so this is from, uh, you know, some of the uh, internal uh, data I have access to, um, but we've definitely seen an, an increase of the malware samples of, of Tor over time. You know, it's a little bit lumpy in some cases, um, but uh, it, it certainly isn't going down. And, um, you know, it, it, I think it's just kind of a matter of time, you know, on the threat landscape if, you know, people, um, you know, don't, you know, start blocking other mechanisms, but they don't really do anything to address Tor, then, you know, more and more authors will just uh, will just go with that. Now, leveraging uh, you know actual cloud apps for command and control. Um, you know, again, this is this is so attractive. And here's the thing. You know, I talked about some of the names that you would know, right? You know, the Twitters, the Amazon, the Microsoft. Um, you know, how they're using like TechNet or something to to uh, encode messages. But really, I'm actually a lot less worried about the the name brand cloud apps than I am, you know, other types of systems, you know, just like how my bakery got, you know, popped with, with Angular, you know, there's so many, you know, mom and pop shops or other organizations, uh, other applications that are out there that won't have, you know, such a sophisticated team with, you know, incredible research staff that'll be able to, you know, basically identify that, hey, something is going on here because now there's all these thousands of hosts that are connecting and, you know, there, there's some shenanigans afoot, right? Um, you know, they might notice eventually when everything totally crashes, but it might take a long time before they get to that point. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and again, it's, it's so, uh, it, it's just, it's such an attractive target because again, you don't have to host anything. You, you give up a little bit of control, uh, but you know, if you can do it right, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of prime for the, for the picking. Um, and along those lines, um, you know, there, it, 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 there's so many different ways that you could leverage a cloud app uh, to be able to, you know, hide that information. Um, you know, whether it's a, an application like Dropbox where you can upload files, whether it's a, you know, a, 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 you know, Snapchat or something, who knows, you know, Snapchat, but Instagram where you can upload an image and have the information inc literally encoded in that image and have people grabbing it and all of a sudden you're trending on, you know, Instagram or whatever, you know, but, but it's really because all this, you know, malware is, is, is phoning home and it's grabbing, it's getting this information, um, you know, uh, it really creates, uh, you know, an, uh, you know, an infinite set of possibilities. So, you know, I expect in, in future years and, and really all the stag we could dedicate a whole talk to, maybe that'll be something I'll cover in a future future talk. Um, but, you know, it's it's really, uh, you know, in my, in my view, uh, you know, as soon as the kind of cat and mouse game catches up, the arms race and attackers say, okay, you know, some of these traditional methods aren't working, I think that, that you'll definitely see more and more that would uh, take advantage of such a prime target. Another thing is, layered evasion. So, um, you know, we see this with, you know, I would say more like the APT style actors um, uh, because, you know, they can kind of, rather than being crimeware and, and massively, you know, uh, uh, triggering a lot of activity, you know, if you're just sending, you know, doing some IP fragmentation with TCP segments, uh, you know, evasions on top of that, um, you know, maybe, you know, throw an SSL above that, HTTP, there's obviously a lot that you can do within uh, the HTTP protocol uh, to be able to hide information. Um, and of course, as I've gone in, in some uh, length, you know, there's a lot that you can do in the actual embedded content itself. Um, starting to leverage these techniques uh, uh, in, um, you know, in, in concert, right? Um, because really it, uh, it's, it's a, a, a way that you can catch, uh, you know, some security vendors off guard that don't basically, uh, you know, even even in 2016, uh, might be blind to either the individual mechanisms or some combination of the mechanisms. Um, it's uh, it's it's definitely a, a real concern. And you know, again, you know, then you can keep on looping all these evasions. Then you tunnel all the traffic. It, it's it's kind of you know up to uh, you know the mind's eye in terms of imagination uh, for how how sophisticated the evasions could get. 
And uh, you know, as I've been saying, a whole bunch steganography is uh, you know just a uh, you know the the possibilities there are so limitless. So um, you know, I would definitely expect to see more and more actors. And I guess the really scary thing about steg is that you know when done right, it's it's so incredibly difficult to identify. Um, you know, as we saw earlier with the with the mirrored images, right? Um, so it's it's almost you know uh, you know what concerns me is more the unknown unknown aspect of uh, of attackers uh, that, that that could leverage this type of uh, technique um, because unlike you know some of the traditional mechanisms that we can use to identify individual patterns, identifying steganography is incredibly difficult in a lot of uh, in a lot of cases, both for a human. And, and even for a machine, so you know how you know how do you do that when you know you have the amount of bandwidth that we're sending, you know, ever increasing. It's getting more and more expensive to cope with that. How do you even identify uh, when this type of technique is being used? Um, it's a it's a very good problem. So we kind of talked a little bit about uh, you know uh, uh, the different uh, uh, trends of predictions. Let's talk about defense, right? What are some of the things that you can do? Take away from this talk to you know basically uh, defend your network, your assets, your infrastructure. Um, and we'll start with the really obvious, but shockingly, uh, it still is not even in in this uh, you know 2016 isn't uh, that highly used. So basically, I took a ton of malware samples, millions of malware samples that we had, um, and looked specifically at the command and control ports um, and, and what ports they were using. And about 17% of the of the malware was using high range TCP ports for command and control. So I'm not even talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, other aspects of the malware, I'm talking specifically for the command and control. Um, and they do that because of course most people leave those wide open. Uh, and that's kind of a bad idea. I, I totally get why and it can be an administrative nightmare, but um, you know, it's, you can eliminate a lot of low hanging fruit uh, when it comes to, to command and control. And basically if you can, with a lot of these uh, pieces of malware, you might be able to totally break it if it can't phone home, right? If it can't get that extra payload, if it can't, you know, share that encryption key or whatever, you can prevent this attack from being successful with, you know, the click of the mouse. Um, you know, another big thing is making sure that you don't have, um, you know, applications uh, that that you wouldn't expect or wouldn't desire on your network running on your network. So, you know, if you're an enterprise and there's no real reason for you to be running Tor, you probably shouldn't allow Tor out uh, because, um, you know, the malware will definitely take advantage of that. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, un unknown binary, I should say streams, but basically, you know, some malware on occasion will just run, you know, some sort of odd encrypted protocol. If you can do deep packet inspection and do uh, basically encryption entropy, which is something that a lot of modern IDSs do uh, and NGFWs, you can identify potentially, uh, you know, uh, unknown uh, types of, uh, of, of malware just because it's, you know, again, it's not matching a, a traditional protocol. It's actually not leveraging steganography. It's kind of standing out like a sore thumb. The next thing is the fingerprint no malware. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this, um, you know, definitely get, get, give a shout out and, and plug to, uh, you know, to ET Open, uh, which is, you know, uh, free to anyone, maintain, uh, you know, we, we curate it, but it's uh, free to anyone in the community. Um, and that's something that we focus uh, heavily on because, you know, rather than having, you know, just trying to only fingerprint all the CVEs and, you know, play the whole CVE game with, you know, 15 year old German help desk software or whatever, you know, focusing on, hey, we see this malware in the wild right now and we're going to specifically identify it. And so if you see this trigger, uh, you know, you really know that, that this is bad. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you know, a lot of people talk about the security poverty line and, and, and I, that's true to some extent, but there are a lot of great open source tools, uh, you know, you don't have to, uh, to, to break an arm and a leg. Uh, to get your hands on, and this is a great example because you know by fingerprinting the no malware, um, you know you can introduce you know kind of a, a, a very good single the signal to noise ratio and basically identify the known bad. Now SSL is you know again it's it's kind of a mixed blessing right uh, because there's just a lot of blind spots nowadays, especially if you're off of an SSL tap. Um, and so there's a few different things that you can do um, uh, when it comes to SSL. Um, you know, a lot of the, there's a lot of new systems that are supporting SSL man in the middle. Again, there's, you know, 
controversy there. Uh, you know, you can't always use it, uh, you know, for good reason, but, um, you know, in, in, if your situation dictates and you can break it open for some traffic, uh, for instance, let's say any SSL site that, you, you know, that, that isn't categorized by, say, like a web filter or something like that, you could break it open and inspect it. You'd be able to identify, you know, potential, uh, you know, uh, command control infection, so on and so forth within that SSL um, stream. But the good news is, is actually you don't have to do that in all cases. Um, and again, you know, uh, the, you know, etopen, abuse.ch is another great uh, source, um, you know, have, um, you know, not only signatures, but publish uh, blacklist, certificate blacklist. So just by, you know, you can actually just view what is a known bad certificate. You never have to crack open the stream. You can just fingerprint it and say, okay, you know, this machine is popped because it's reaching back, you know, using a, you know, let's say Drydex, uh, uh, you know, known bad SSL, so going to a known bad site. Um, so it doesn't require you to actually crack open the stream to figure that out. Heuristics and anomaly detection, you know, normally these things drive us all crazy because they're so chatty and so, you know, kind of unreliable. But as you probably saw in a bunch of the samples, especially on some of the targeted attacks, um, you know, basically if, uh, you know, if uh, you, um, you know, it, it, when leveraged in the right context, they can really, you know, light up like a Christmas tree because you will find, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of the different types of techniques and these layered evasion techniques, uh, it's a great way to defeat it. Again, it doesn't require a commercial solution. There's tons of off-the-shelf stuff that you can do and leverage uh, to be able to detect these types of techniques. And really it's, you know, at the end of the day, just giving a shit, right? Um, you know, a lot of people, um, they just don't, right? You know, and, and they're, they're just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, I, I was told, you know, there's kind of three types of organizations, right? You have like the compliant, you have security conscious, and you have the, um, uh, and you have the um, uh, security sensitive. So the compliant is just like, I don't care, I just need to buy this so I can check off this PCI checklist and, you know, just tell me how much it is, go away. And you have security, sen uh, con uh, you know, conscious who are like, hey, we, w we want to do the right thing. We don't have, you know, a whole team of experts, um, you know, and, and, and they're, you know, definitely a perfect audience for this because, again, you know, you can get, you know, even without having to spend an arm and a leg, you can get solutions that can help you if you actually care. And security sensitive, you know, they kind of have a, a, you know, a, a whole practice going on and, you know, l less worried about them. They kind of know what to do. Um, uh, but, you know, perhaps the most importantly is to get involved, right? Um, so there's, and, and I don't mean like in a, like spend money, donate or anything kind of way, like if you find, uh, you know, command control channels, interesting samples, um, you know, in your own environment, um, you know, it's really easy to get them into the broader community. Uh, you know, ET Open is a great way, uh, Snort, uh, you know, VRT uh, as well. There's other foundations. If you're a coder, you can develop, help develop, uh, you know, some of the engines that can detect this stuff. Uh, you know, Suricata, Snort Bro, uh, Moloch, there, there's a whole bunch of, uh, different ways that, that you can uh, get involved. So uh, just to kind of wrap this up, because I know it's beer clock and uh, we definitely uh, definitely don't want to impose on that. Um, so, so basically, the trends speak for themselves. You know, I don't have to speak in hyperbole. Everyone knows, you know, how serious the, the actual malware and compromise problems are, um, you know, and, and, uh, and it's only getting worse. It's really not gotten to a point where it's better. Tax surface is so massive, there's so many different ways that, that we can get breached, but you know, we can leverage our strengths, and in this case, detecting command and control channels, which is our attacker's weakness in a lot of case, cases to be able to you know, both prevent infections and, uh, and counteract you know, when they do happen, respond quickly. Um, and, you know, basically as we up our game, they're going to up their game. We, you know, got to have a, you know, kind of a line of sight to where things are going in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but, but as long as we kind of stay in touch, in tune, you know, review our, uh, you know, with the community, reviewing our, our logs, our information, our infrastructure, what it has to tell us, uh, you know, that's really kind of the best shot that we have at mitigating this stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, basically that's what I got. And I want to say a few thank yous. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, thank you all. Thanks, DEF CON, you know, for uh, accepting this talk. Let me get up here on the soapbox. And uh, yeah, for everyone for, for attending, coming all the way over here from Bally's, missing out on Mr. Robot. I saw them all in the green room. It was really funny. I was like, oh my God, it's like, I'm not worthy. But uh, uh, so yeah, and like basically the whole Emerging Threats team, Proofpoint, yeah, there's too many people to name. But uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>